Carl Ferre, I'm so happy to have you with us. It's such a pleasure and such a treat. So come show yourself and Lenny, feel free to jump in anytime. Lenny Jacobs will be our moderator for this evening's or today's for Carl, actually this morning's talk. So Carl, how are you? Uh, I'm doing good. Um, I'm here, I'm awake. So ready to start. Um, Good night. Yeah. Yes. Good night. Are you there? Are, I'll yeah. call on you to mute or unmute or call on people when there's questions later. That's the deal. Okay. <clears throat> so anyhow, welcome everybody. Welcome Carl. Welcome people from all over the world to our monthly forum with Gennad Rice and her guests. Carl Ferre is our speaker today. Carl is in Chico, California, Northern California, for those who, of you who are unfamiliar with the areas of North America, United States. Carl has been practicing, studying, and working with macrobiotics since the early 1970s, 1975, I believe, is this uh, beginning of practice. He began working at the Georgia Sama Macrobiotic Foundation that was founded by, I believe, Herman Ihara and his friends. Carl started working there in 1978 and is the current president of the foundation. He's the editor of Macrobiotics Today magazine. He's directed the French Meadows summer camp for 37 years. He's run the Georgia Sala Macrobiotic Foundation publishing company that has published many, many books. He's the author of The Essential Guide to Macrobiotics. Acid and Alkaline Companion, and a compiler of the essential Georgia Sawa material. He and his family are living in Chico, California, and Carl is going to tell some stories about his experiences and his background, his interest and discoveries of uh, living a macrobiotic lifestyle with him, his family for 50 years. Carl. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll start um, basically at the beginning, um, 1865. No, uh, <laughs> I was going to start when my grandfather was born. But anyway, um, so in the early 70s, I had gotten into, um, well, my sister gave me a book, uh, Food is Your Best Medicine by Dr. Henry Beeler, Beiler, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but anyway, I found his book, and then I got into Adele Davis, which is Diet for a Small Planet, a lot of food combining, um, and I hated to cook meat, so I was already essentially a vegetarian because I just didn't like to clean it up, so once I got out on my own, I um, was a quasi-vegetarian. And in 1974, I went to visit um, some friends in West Virginia. They had a triple wedding going on with some musician friends. And I went out uh, to help them uh, build a community center and participate in the wedding. And while I was there, they said they were going to go see a guy named Lost John, way up in the hills, rolling hills of West Virginia. So we pull up. And here's Lost John on the porch, jumping up and down, dancing. And he had a bottle that he was holding up, which was, he said, 23 herbs, he called them his bitters, that would cure anything. No matter what you had, you just buy a bottle of this for $10. And so he's, you know, doing all this all these gyrations, everything. So he finishes, people were going up and buying, paying $10 for his bottle of this, his bitters. So they asked me if I wanted to meet him and go inside and meet him after the present, after his little performance. So I go um, inside and he's sitting on a chair and we talked for a little bit and then Somebody said, somebody opened a medicine cabinet and said, 
should we give him his kidney medication now? And I was like pretty shocked. And somebody said, well, no, he has another performance in two hours and that one makes him drowsy. So give him his heart medication now and we'll give him the <laughs> kidney medication after the next after the next performance. So we get back in the car. I didn't say anything at the time, but we got in the car and I asked if that was a little unethical. If they thought that was unethical that he was selling this stuff. And they said, well, not really, because every everybody knows him. It's way out in the woods here. And people just take turns coming out and paying $10 for a bottle of the stuff to keep the guy going. And it's really not not any big deal. Somebody else said, well, if we could just get him on macrobiotics, he wouldn't need the medications. And I heard this in the back seat, and the people in the front seat changed the subject right away and didn't want to talk about it. So we go to a store, and at the time, I was still into a lot of dairy and thinking that you had to drink milk, you know, and since the place I was staying at had no electricity and so no animal food and no milk, uh, I bought a big old carton of milk and was planning to have that during the day, uh, during the rest of the day. Um, so anyway, I'm standing by the car waiting for other people to get back and one of the girls got back and I said, say I heard this term macrobiotics. What does that mean? And she said, oh, that's easy. No meat, no sugar, no dairy, no fun. That was the first definition I heard. So I told her, I'll never do that. And I took the carton of milk out of the bag that it was in, opened it up and chugged the whole thing in front of her to show her that I would never do this. So the word in macrobiotics never came up again. And so I, went back to Texas where I was living in Denton, Texas. And so that's the first story. Denton, Texas, I never knew that. Yeah. <laughs> so what's next? What's next on this uh, saga? Okay. Wait, maybe you know my cousin. I have a cousin <clears throat> in Denton. So go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, well, I, um, so I was, uh, teaching classical guitar at the time in Denton, Texas, the University of North Texas, um, which was at that time uh, North Texas State University. But <clears throat> what I want to get across in this talk is how things that, little things that happen kind of lead to other things that eventually get you to where you are. So, um, what happened next was I got back and at that <clears throat> place, they made granola and with no sweetener. It was seasoned with soy sauce. And I really liked it. And they also had soy flakes in it. So um, I was looking for soy flakes to make granola so I asked my brother if he knew where I could find some soy flakes. And he said, he said, oh, there's a store down just off the square called Infinity Natural Foods. And he said, there's a lot of nuts and flakes down there. And he meant the people, but anyway, that was his perception of them. But anyway, I go down there and um, I found soy flakes. They had soy flakes and they had all kinds of flaked grains. And so I was able to make the granola and I started frequenting the store. <clears throat> so several, <clears throat> excuse me, several things happened at the store. Um, one of which, um, one guy, um, Dave, who was the owner of the store, gave me a copy of Cancer and the Philosophy of the Far East and asked me to read it. And said, why don't you read this and then come to dinner? 
um, invited me over to his house to dinner to have a macrobiotic meal. So I actually had my first macrobiotic meal at his house. Uh, somebody else said, just while I was shopping, just said, you know, you don't have to be all clogged up like that. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're all clogged up. And <clears throat> I can tell, and I can tell you everything that you've been eating. So he proceeded to tell me what I had been eating for the last month, at least. Well, actually years, because I tend to eat the same thing all the time. But anyway, he <clears throat> he told me what I was eating. So, but the biggest thing he did was he said, I'll bet you can't um, go a week without sugar. He said, you're addicted to sugar. And I said, no, I'm not addicted to sugar. That's ridiculous. I can go a week without sugar. So this was on a Monday. So I lasted until Sunday. And Sunday was the day I go to the folks house, of course. And so I go to the house and I had told them that I was not eating meat anymore, that I had stopped. Animal food was not gonna eat any meat. And of course the meal was turkey. And not only had they sit me right in front of the turkey, but my dad slices off a big piece, sticks it on a plate, and gives it to me. And I said, I'm sorry, but I already told you I'm not going to eat meat, etc. This made a long conversation. Uh, my mom finally interceded and said, let him, let him not eat meat. That's fine. So he takes the plate back. He pushes the turkey off of it and hands me the plate. And I said, pardon me, but I need a clean plate because this one has the essence of the turkey still on it. And I didn't know what he was going to do at that point. He kind of looked at me and I was like, you know, what's going to happen? Um, but anyway, we diffused the situation. And so I didn't have the turkey. So now we get done eating and it's time for dessert. And the dessert was pumpkin pie, which is one of my favorites growing up. Sugar pumpkin pie, of course. And I said, I'm not going to have the pumpkin pie because I didn't eat the meat. See, you guys ate the meat, so you need the sugar to balance. I thought I knew everything at this point, of course. And so I said, you need the sugar because you're balancing the meat, and I don't need it. And so, you know, I'm... I'm sitting there basically, you know, uh, self-righteous, so to speak. And so I don't have the dessert. So after dinner, after lunch, um, or dinner as we called it, Sunday dinner, we go in to watch football. That was the the family, what the family did. So by halftime, Everybody else is asleep. They're all in front of the TV asleep. I'm wide awake. And all of a sudden, I'm walking toward the kitchen without really being conscious of being walking toward the kitchen and not wanting to walk toward the kitchen, but I'm walking toward the kitchen. And all of a sudden, my hands start shaking. And I'm like, but then my whole body's shaking and I get to the kitchen and to make a long story short, two pieces of pie later, and not only two <laughs> pie, but two pieces of pie with ice cream on each one, sugared ice cream on each one. I finished the pie and I went, I'm addicted to sugar. That's how I knew so that started me on this journey um, that I'm on, basically. Um, <clears throat> but I like I like the philosophy of the book, um, Cancer and the Philosophy of the Far East. I like the story of Schweitzer and um, all of that. So all of that really contributed to it. But then, I, so I started a macrobiotic practice that was 1975. Um, in in uh, Texas. 
So how did how did that proceed then to uh, to Northern California and uh, and a deeper uh, awareness of, uh, of of how diet affected you and 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 how did your parents uh, respond to that uh, change? Oh well, um, they were basically supportive, um, and my mom basically it became. Uh, she, she started cooking more macrobiotically and she basically changed my dad's diet, which um, resulted in him living a lot longer than he would have had he not, had she not changed the diet. So they were very supportive. So <clears throat> that was not a problem. But what happened was a group of us um, at the, the co-op, because I had become a member of the co-op, and we had about 120 people um, who frequent, frequented the place and would come to potlucks and things. So we have, we had about 30 of us that were going to go out to the French Meadows camp. We all had heard about it, and my friend Dave, who had started the co-op, was now working with Herman at, at Vega and the, the foundation so he invited us all out to summer camp so it turned out only four of us went so uh, i drove we get there on time um to california the french meadows camp and so i see my friend dave and i was a stickler for being on time so I got there right at one o'clock, which is when it said it started. And he said, well, the first event's not till two o'clock. <clears throat> so just hang out. I suggest you go down to the stream, sit in the stream for an hour. Looks like you're pretty tensed, tensed up. And I was, I was very good. Anyway, but I was there. And so at two o'clock, I met where he said to meet, which was at the back of the green truck. So I, I get to the back of the green truck with all the supplies for the camp inside, a big flatbed green truck at that, in those days. And Herman was there. He was the only one there. And he hands me a, a pair of gloves. And he said, we unload a truck. And I said, <clears throat> I said, Herman, shouldn't we wait for other people so we have more help to unload the truck? He said, no, 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 we unload a truck and, you know, Cornelia needs kitchen, get kitchen set up. So we start, they'll come, don't worry. So we did that. We unloaded the truck. Other people did come. Uh, we finished unloading the truck and some people went to help Cornelia in the kitchen. And the rest of us went with Herman with, he had like three or four chainsaws and we all go out in the woods to gather firewood. So we gather firewood, then we moved tables. So all of this was the first classes. The, cl the classes were actually setting up the camp, <laughs> but you got to do it with Herman and Cornelia. So it was very, uh, let's be very good, et cetera. So, Anyway, so I basically um, wound up um, helping Herman during that time, and, and my friend Dave was running the bookstore, so he had me come in and help run the bookstore, so I helped run the bookstore um, and uh, finished the camp. You know, another thing that I recall from the camp is when they asked for people to um, clean the soot off the bottom of the pots because they cooked over wood stoves and there was always soot on the bottom of these big black pots that they had. And so they asked for volunteers. When nobody raised their hand, Herman raised his hand. So Herman was cleaning the soot off the bottom of the pots. So a year later, in 1978, I was deciding what I wanted to do. I was teaching classical guitar, and the flute professor, who I knew very well, um, was getting his 50-year retirement and getting a gold watch. And I thought, I don't want to be 50 years teaching classical guitar and get a gold watch. So 
I want to do something else with my life. So I had a bunch of different, um, I had an offer to work with the CIA and a bunch of other things, but that's a whole nother story. But um, so I, I'm deciding where to go and work. And I decided I wanted to help out macrobiotics. So um, I couldn't imagine at the time Misho Kushi cleaning pots or, you know, the soot off the bottom of pots or going and gathering firewood and all of these things. So I decided to go work with Herman. So I, I moved out. That's decided to move out to California in 1978. So that's how I, how I got there. Carl, how, how old were you at the time? And uh, what, what were you thinking about in terms of uh, financial uh, support? Um, well, okay, so I would have been, uh, let's see, when I started 75, I was um, 28. So what would that be, three years? You're in your early 30s then. Yeah. And people are thinking about making a living and having a family. How does that relate to what um, you were thinking of and how you proceeded? Yeah, I was, um, okay, well, I was a confirmed bachelor and was never going to get married. So that was my other other thing that I said I would never do that didn't turn out that way. But I guess the message is don't ever say never, you know, never do something because that leads you into it. But um, I wasn't too concerned about money in those days. I was never concerned about money uh, ever. So um, still not. So anyway, um, yeah, it is. I basically said I would come work for a year and give a year back. That was my idea was I had read Osawa give, give, give infinitely. And I wanted to give back. He he basically wrote, I recall saying that, you know, a lot of people never showed appreciation, never gave anything back. They always just took what he said and went on their way. And so I said, well, I'll be one who gives back. So that's why I, you know, went out to work for him. And so what was it about those principles or the diet or what was it that was the most magnetic besides cleaning the bottom of the pots? What did you feel like, you know, what resonated with you that continues to resonate 50 years later? Um, okay, we'll get into that. I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll get to there. Uh, so um basically i would i would say one word oneness but we're going to get there um so basically i i get to the the camp uh i mean get to work at the foundation and we go to camp in 78 and we're there and i'd only been there i, I arrived in may camp was in july so we arrive at the camp and four of the speakers who were supposed to speak at the camp that year for the presenters didn't show up. So Herman asked me, he said, what should I do? And I said, well, we meet and we get everybody that can teach a class together that you know might be able to teach a class and we'll make a program. So we meet and I, I said, okay, so who can teach Doeen? Bob Carr raised his hand. Who can teach Shiatsu? Bob Carr raised his hand. <laughs> it became the Bob Carr camp. So he basically taught most of the classes, but Herman and Cornelia did classes. I said, I said, well, I said, Her Herman, why don't you talk to the women? And Cornelia, why don't you talk to the men? And which didn't work out so well because the women were all laughing and having a good time. We could hear them. And the men were all over on the other side. And Cornelia was telling us that we were all too yin and that we needed to get more young. Um, but anyway, so basically um, we did the camp. I helped organize that in a way. And then 
Herman said, well, he said, I have another problem for you. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, we always have the closing circle after lunch on Sunday. Then we have to walk, clean all the dishes, go back to the kitchen, clean the dishes, load everything up in the truck and get to Japanese restaurant in Sacramento. You know, we're always late because the, <clears throat> the uh, closing panel always lasts so long. And I, I said, well, that's easy. I said, you have the closing panel at the, um, at the fire circle and it's shady at that time of the day and everybody's sitting down. I said, just move it out to where the volleyball court ended up being. It wasn't in those days because we didn't have volleyball, but you know, move it out in the sun and have people standing up. And I said, and that that will do it. And what I realized was when you have a big group of people and you ask for questions, you let just let people talk when they want to, the young people always go first. And they're always short concise and they make their point and they get done and then the in people come on talk 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 and they just talk forever so what happened was the young people talked they were real quick and by the time it got to the in people the sun had melted them all and they didn't talk so the thing got done very fast so that's people, brilliant <laughs> I eventually changed all of that, but basically after that camp, Herman said, well, you run camp from now on. So <laughs> basically I was going to go, I was going to move back to Texas at the end of the year, but um, decided that um, I had gotten a lot and I had learned a lot. So I thought that, and I'm going to get to what the learning was. Um, but I decided to go back to Texas, get my stuff, come back and and work there. Um, so basically, that's um, what I did. And um, that's a brilliant application of yin and yang. I really like that. Yeah, that was that was my first for in the yin and yang. But we want to know how you met Julia. Oh, um Okay, so uh, I met Julia at the camp. Um, so I've told this story at the camp. I shouldn't. I shouldn't tell it. I, no, <laughs> I have to look around. Make sure she's not listening. But uh, no, basically, um, we were unloading the truck one day, and she came around that the side of the truck. We were in the kitchen moving tables into the kitchen. Uh, those who have been to camp know the process that we moved all the tables from the other campgrounds to one campground to have, make a big eating area. And You might it, want to mention that the kitchen means under a different tree. Right. It's <laughs> under under trees. Um, there's There were no the outhouses were the only structures and there's no electricity. There's, you know, we did have water um, most years. Anyway, um, so she was, she came around the corner and the minute I saw her, it was instant attraction. Um, and um, not for her, but for me. But <laughs> af after the camp, um, she became, Cornelia's cooking assistant. So she came and stayed at the foundation for um, for a year, you know, to help Cornelia in the kitchen. And um, her boyfriend basically dumped her at camp. Um, so she, that's how she ended up there. Interestingly, um, for those who know the story, um, Herman and Cornelia were in a, a uh, van accident in Missouri, a Spiral Inn camp out in Missouri, Bill Warden's uh, camp. And 
Julia was in the car. Excuse me. So that was the connection that all happened. Another synchronicity that happened that just kind of happened. Anyway, um, so um, once I tasted her cornbread, that was that was it. I love cornbread, so uh, and it was so good that. Anyway, so we ended up, um, you know, getting married, etc. So anyway, back to back to where I was. So in we had several. The first significant thing happened in seventy nine. The next camp, when Mister Fukuoka came from Japan as our special guest, and so <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so he was he was there. Had interpreters with him. Larry Corin was with him, and. Uh, I had a woman interpreter who was interpreting his Japanese to English. And he asked us to look at a tree. And the tree he asked us to look at was the Doeen tree. For those who had been to camp, there was a big tree by the fireplace area, um, pretty close to where Mike and Maria Chan always camped. And that was the Doeen tree. It was tall called pine tree and he said look at the tree and, and tell me what you see and we're all scratching our heads and finally somebody said a tree and he said very good he said now imagine that you're a baby and you can still see as well as you could see but you haven't been taught the difference between a tree, the ground, the sky, the clouds, other people. What does the baby see? The baby sees the infinite world. The baby doesn't see separated things. It sees everything together as one whole. So he described it as he drew a, a circle on the board and he said it's like the finite world is a bubble, and we're living inside this bubble. And the infinite world is all around us. He said, but the most important thing is that the infinite world is also inside. It's also in the finite world. So basically, you're looking at the infinite world right now. The infinite world is not something way out there. And to me, it was always, you know, when I was growing up, it was always, oh, there's heaven and it's way out there somewhere, you know, beyond the clouds. And it's not, you know, it's something different, something separate. And I remember Herman at camp talking about it once. And he said, it's like, we always talk about there's one more river to cross. We're going to cross this river. We're going to get to the infinite world. He said, but once you cross the river and you turn around and look, you don't see the finite world. It doesn't exist and you don't see the river. So that's what I was grappling with. And that's where I was at that time. So, Carl, I wonder, yeah. do you could... Does it make sense to you to depict, you just said there's like a bubble of the finite world with infinite around it and mm -hmm. inside. Does it make sense to you to depict that bubble with dashed lines rather than a solid one that the infinity is within? <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it, you could you could do it that way. However you want to present it, uh, to think of it, um, I came to a, a different realization, which basically you don't even need the uh, dash lines or any lines at all, but we'll, we'll get there too. <laughs> um, so basically, um, then the next thing that happened was I was, uh, teaching one time about 
unification of apparent opposites. So I would say, you know, day and night, cold and hot, up and down, in and out, all of those. And I was talking about the unification of those. And somebody, I mentioned time and space. <clears throat> I was I was mentioning time. I mentioned time and space, and somebody said, how are time and space related? And I kind of went, uh, and I really didn't know at the time how to describe that other than you can't have time without space, and you can't have space without time. And I was getting kind of confused. So I said, well, we'll talk about that later. So I always thought about that. I thought about that for <clears throat> many years. And what happened was I started thinking, okay, so time and space are related. If I'm 12 steps away from the blackboard, then it's going to take me a certain amount of time to get to walk those 12 steps. So let's say it takes three seconds. So I started thinking, oh, I can go, you know, I get halfway. Let's say I get halfway, and <clears throat> let's say if, when I get halfway, I all of a sudden become half as big. So now my strides are half the size. So now I'm still 12 steps away from the board. And I... I'm still three seconds away from the board if it takes me three seconds to go 12 steps. If I go halfway and make myself halfway smaller again, then I'm still 12 steps away from the board. So I started thinking about this and I read in one of the very early, the 1960s, George Osawa, a lot of George Osawa's writing is in the 1960s in the early magazines. So <clears throat> he mentioned the thing concept called scale of observation. And the scale of observation is basically, let's say you have sugar, refined sugar, and charcoal, very fine charcoal. You take equal amounts and you mix them together. And what do you see? You see a gray powder because that's what you see on your plate in front of you. But he said, imagine you're an ant, half or a, a third the size of one of the grains of sugar. You don't see gray powder. You see black and white boulders because that's your scale of observation. So I was taking that to say, so basically then he went on to say that science is limited by its scale of observation, its instrumentation. So it can't go beyond what it can see, what it can measure. And so I was enthralled with that concept as well. And thinking about I started thinking, so what would I see from the infinite? If I'm looking from the infinite, if I'm viewing life from the infinite, what would I be seeing? So I'm thinking of all of these things and I go back to the board. I'm making myself half as big. So I never get to the board because I'm always half as big as I am. So I said, I wonder if I could make myself small enough to go inside my body and find my center. So I was very big on trying to find the center. So my question was, where's the center of infinity? If there's no boundary, where's the center? Or is every place the center? So I'm dealing with these questions and I go inside my body and I say, okay, I'm going to try to find my center. So I go, where's my center? Well, I'd always been taught the hara, right? So two inches below the navel. So I go there, I go inside 
and I I look and what do I see? I see a bunch of cells. And so I go, okay, so I can just make myself smaller and go inside the cells. And what do I see? I see billions of atoms. So I have to find one that I think is my center and I go inside that. I go in, inside the nucleus of one of the atoms and I see subatomic particles inside. So I go inside there and what do I see? So for me, what I saw was waves of vibrational waves. And basically these days you can look, you can Google these things, you can find images of <laughs> vibrational waves and subatomic particles. You, you can see images of those things. But for me, it was all being done, you know, mentally trying to figure it out. So then I go inside, I'm still picking out the center of each of these things. I go inside the, the waves, the vibrational waves. I go inside of one of those. And <clears throat> the first time I did this, I've now changed it, but I'm going to give you the first time. The first time I saw little wisps of spirals, some going inward and some going outward. And that was my perception of it. But that has changed over the years. What I see now is pulsation, very quick, outward, inward, out in, out in, out in, out in, out in, out in. And right, just going, and it's, they're actually moving so fast that they're faster than the speed of light. So science is never gonna see them. <laughs> Uh, but they are going, and that's what create those are what creates space. That's what creates the space and the whole infinite universe. So basically, I get a hold of one of these, and I have to go inside there. And what do I see? That's where I got to, and I look, and I don't know that I can describe it other than uh, just light, nothingness, spaciousness, silence, any of those words, I, you know, words don't really describe, but it's, so I, I found that, and I said, that's my center. And then I realized that I could have gone to, I could have gone to any place inside my arm. Any place I go, I can get to that same place. And then I thought, well, everybody else has that same center. So we all have the same center and we're all connected in that way. So now I have a perception of how I can see things so I can say, we are all connected. So for many years, I said, oh, we're all connected because I just was repeating. But now I, I see how we're all connected because we're all connected because we all have this, this stillness that's at the center of everything. Does that make sense? Well, can Fantastic. I interrupt? Or, yeah, yeah, that's a great teaching. How, how, do, how would you connect that to, was that something that you discovered from studying Herman's, Ihara's, uh, George Asawa's teachings, writings, or was this a something that happened because of the diet that you were on? Or what, what was the inspiration for this insight and how does that relate to your macrobiotics? Well, uh, I I think it's a direct uh, result of studying the order of the universe. Basically, contemplating the order of the universe daily, so that I <clears throat> every day 
I could think. I get to that place where I'm connected. And if I get to the connection place, I realize that the outer stuff is very secondary. So, um, yeah, so it came, it came from that. I don't, I, I think having a relatively or a, a clean diet, what I would call a clean diet helped. Um, as, as I see it, diet allows you to have, uh, you have a clean body that can result in a, a clearer mind. And then the clearer mind results in a more openness to receive things. I mean, I, I think basically it just came to me. I don't think it, you know, because maybe I was ready for it. I I don't know. That's. Have you taught this, Carl? Have you, I wonder how it was received. Also, I wanted yeah. to mention Phyllis Perun is waiting to ask a question. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, So what was the first question? How have you taught this? Have you taught oh, this? I taught yeah, I taught it at camp uh, one time. I had people basically do it as an exercise and, and to see what they were seeing, uh, you know, as, as we went through the various layers. What do you see when you go inside the waves of vibration, for example? So, <clears throat> uh, you know, and other things basically happened with all this. So one more thing I wanted to get into um, was the Herman wrote up Osawa's idea of a universal broadcasting system. And that is that all ideas come from the infinite, come from the universe. And we just pick up the ones that are we're like a radio and we're tuning in the dial on the radio and we're picking up different messages, different thoughts from the infinite. So um, I thought about that and how that fits into this is I believe those pulsations are where those thoughts can, can manifest, can move. Okay, because these vibrations, if you think of them, if you think of them as separate things, the pulsations that are happening, uh, if they're overlapping, they can then communicate and send thoughts. So in our physical body, we can only move so fast, right? We have a limit. But your mind could think very quickly. I think one of the last times I was on here, I, I said, pretend you're on the moon. And I asked people, how long did it take you to get there? Everybody went like that. Boop, we're on the moon. You know. And then I asked how many were in spacesuits. So you know, nobody was. So we all passed away. But anyway. Um, you know, so the mind could move very, very quickly. So those things are moving fast because that's part of this. But the whole idea <clears throat> was, uh, yeah. So then the next thing, the, the latest thing, I guess, would be that... Uh, let's see. Um, so I was, I was thinking, Herman. Carl, I have a good question for you. If this is a good moment to interrupt, someone's asking: Do human interactions have influence onto this pulsating system? Yes. Do human interactions influence the pulse? Right. It's it, it. Okay. So, uh, yes. So let me uh, say one one more thing. So Herman basically um, 
in lectures, but often talk about that we have what thirty seven point two trillion cells uh, inside the body, and uh, I believe there's what ninety six million cells die every minute. That's what I read. I don't have my notes in front of me, but that's what I got off the internet, basically. And those 196 cells are replaced. Okay, so where did the where is the material for those 196 million cells that are dying every minute and getting replaced every minute? Where does that come from? So it turns out that the new cells are made out of the dying cells. So basically, we're all being recycled all the time. So then it occurred to me that our thoughts are also being recycled all the time. So thoughts come in, thoughts go out. Food comes in, food goes out. You see what I see what I'm saying? So what happens is whatever you're thinking helps produce what you're going to get. So I believe everybody's successful. Everybody gets what they want. They just don't always want what they get. <laughs> but they they want what you want is what you get. So you can basically change that. And that gets into another thing that goes beyond macrobiotics. But um, so back to everything being recycled. So that's where, yes, whatever you think basically then goes out into the universe and it's going to be part of what's thought and comes back to be or anybody else. So, uh, yeah, so another experience I had of uh, just uh, uh, was when I was thinking about the vibrational world. And we happened into, we were visiting New Hampshire, Julia and I, and, and she's a rock hound. She likes crystals and rocks and all kinds of things. So she has this amazing large crystal that she takes with her. So we go into this shop and the guy is there and I'm talking to him. He's, he was saying that all of the minerals in his shop have a vibration. And I said, yes, because I knew this because the vibration is those waves of vibration. So everything has vibrational waves in it, including the rocks and the, you know, the soil and everything else. So, so he and I, while Julia was talking with him, he and I were communicating on the vibrational level. And <laughs> I don't know how to explain it other than we were able to carry on this conversation at the same time he was talking. Obviously, he was more advanced than me because, you know, I could haven't been able to do that. But uh, anyway, it, it happened. So, you know, when these things happen, you just pay attention and, uh, you know, it, it comes on. So, uh, yeah. Carl, but, let's ask... Uh... Phyllis Perun to unmute and oh. ask her a question. Okay. I'll take a drink. Am I unmuted? Yes. Now you are. Well, you know, I came to see, to hear you talk because I didn't know this until recently that you and I share philosophy as a background which I think is part of the reason why we connect so well, because I just love intellectual games. <laughs> <laughs> and this concept of, you know, can I really cross the room? Uh, it's just fun. I mean, obviously we cross the room because the answer to that is we take the leap of faith. 
So, I mean, you can divide infinity up into little bits and you never get to it because the little bits are infinite. And you can keep playing that game over and over intellectually. And it's interesting. But when you want to eat a meal, you got to go cook it. So, I mean, basically, you just come to action at that point. And you take the faith that the infinite is not going to interfere with you having some kind of a, an action that you can take. The other thing that I find, the, the point the point that I'm most interested in is the difference between Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy, which is actually how I got into macrobiotics. Because studying philosophy, I started in 59 and graduated in 63. There was basically very little Eastern philosophy in the United States. But my professor handed me a book from India, and he was a, uh, a Socratic philosopher. He said, you need to read this because you're spending entirely too much time studying Wittgenstein. So why don't you go read this book? It's about the East, and we don't have any other books, and this is it. So I got that book, and then I ran into macrobiotics, incidentally. Um, and then I realized that's the teaching of the complementary opposites. And what Aristotle represents is opposing opposites. So you get, you know, this in the West and you get this from the East. I just think that's probably the central, most interesting concept. And it keeps me fascinated endlessly because we have these two opposing parts of the world that came in conflict in uh, the, the Mediterranean. And, but we're still having the battle, like which is correct. So when you use the word science, I assume you're talking about Western laboratory science. Okay, well, that's different than cosmological science and ancient science and Taoist science, which might be more mystical and have different concepts. And then I always love to quote Herman, let's go fishing. Phyllis, <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can get some reactions to your ideas. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> that's a, a valid point. I mean, what Herman always taught us was that in the East, they start with the universal and go down to the particular talks about how they write their address. They write the, you know, Japan first and go down to the particular where they are, where we write ours backwards or backwards to them from the particular toward the universal, if you see what I mean. So yeah. to me, it's harder to go from everything separate and try to unify it than it is to start with it unified. If you start with it unified, then the separations are only apparent. I mean, they're only our perception, the scale of observation again. Excuse me, that's called the Humpty Dumpty theory. Oh, well, I, I <laughs> the had Humpty a... theory, you know, you can take it apart, but you can't put it back together, it's Greek. It's just got this modern name. But you did it already. Because if you're looking at the infinite from the finite or from the absolute, you're still looking at it. In other words, you can't get around the problem. There's no solution. It's a circular problem. That's why I just call it an intellectual game. Because the more you go there, the more you come back to where you were, theoretically speaking. So we may as well go fishing. I had a friend from Europe to talk philosophy she was a long history and a much older woman when I met her um, and we would talk philosophy at her parties and she'd say in spite of philosophy have something to eat <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask Alice if she would like to unmute and ask a question Alice, do you know how to unmute the bottom left corner on your screen? 
Uh, by the way, also, we are at the hour mark. So uh, I invite you, if Carl's willing, to stay a little bit more if you have to leave. Of course, I understand. That's no, true anytime. I'm, Is that okay, I'm, Carl? Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm okay. Alice, are we not hearing from you? No. So, Carl, go ahead. Carl, I just wanted to clarify for myself, when we're talking about vibrational level, is that the most basic level of yin and yang after we've got oneness and then it bifurcates? Is that the level of vibration? No, vibration is a fifth world. Vibration is social judgment. So to me, I've written this in acrobatics today, but to me, the seven levels of judgment, or what I call them now, the uh, types of awareness, the seven of those are correspond to the seven kingdoms or the seven worlds of the order of the universe. So, and those, and you could basically fit the 12 theorems in there, you could basically fit all of Osawa's philosophy into that structure. The seven conditions of health, the seven conditions of sickness, mm -hmm. they all follow. So the fifth level is vibration is social. So you can see how interaction socially and a vibrational level is, it fits just like the intellectual fits with the subatomic mm -hmm. world. So they they all fit to me. So the, the pulsations are actually the yin and yang, outward, inward, outward, inward, outward, inward. That's, that's the yin and yang part of it. The vibration is the energy part, which animates the particles, which then become atoms. Okay, so I misspoke. So it's the pulsation, which is the yin and yang level. Yes. Good. Can I ask, Carl, how would you describe macrobiotics from the perspective of what you've been offering? What would you define or describe as what macrobiotics means? Lenny, um, you're a terror. I've, I've been searching for this ever since I heard that, that first uh, definition. Uh, no, no meat, no sugar, no dairy, no fun. Um, so I have, over the years, many different explanations, many different ways of describing it. Um, but um, if you're asking me, I mean, basically, if somebody asks me, I always tailor it to whatever I think that person where they're coming from. So uh, I'm not as much on the um, dietary side of it. Uh, you know, I eat grains and vegetables. So, you know, it's all fine. But, um, and I'm not too much on the health side of it either. Like, like that it can cure things and things like that. I think it, the cure is more realizing the bigger picture of everything. So um, yeah, it's, uh, that's, uh, did that even get close? <laughs> you told us what it's not. Oh, not diet and not cure. Oh, um, it's so uh, I would say just I'm talking off the top of my head. I mean, I could read the definitions I've done in the past, but I want to be more spontaneous and just say what I'm feeling right now, which is uh, it's it's a way of uh, viewing the world. Uh, Uh, so, as, as you know, I'm, uh, and nobody else will understand this, but I keep going back to hearing Simon's words. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, uh, 
I like that, a way of viewing the world. Well, well um, you know, I've, like it's a set of principles that could be used to improve one's life. That's, Thank you. Yeah, that's that's what I would we say. We have a question or a comment from Norio. Oh, great. Good to see you. Hello. <laughs> uh, hi. Hey, yeah. Thank you for your story. I really enjoyed your, <laughs> your sharing your story. And I think that what you're pointing to is is at the core of what George Osawa was pointing to. Oh. I really feel like that's really what he was teaching. It was not really about the food. Although not that food isn't important. Of course it is important. We all know that, but uh but all of life is we can say is important. But uh and uh like you, I don't like to use it's now maybe you, you don't feel this way, but I've avoided using the word macrobiotics my whole life. Because uh, I feel like um, in the same way uh, uh, your story talked about Fukuoka talking about the tree. And <laughs> what we don't really what, what, what we don't appreciate is we don't appreciate what language is. And, and the word tree is not the tree, is not what is really there. What's really there is just energy, vibration. And then when when we as humans come say the word tree, that that word tree is what creates the form prior to the word there's only prior to languaging of any kind there's only vibration energy and uh so so that's <laughs> and i think that's what i th i believe that's what you're pointing to is that correct uh, yeah yeah so when you look at the tree so when i can look at a tree now i can see it down to the molecular level that I could I could see the energy in it. I could see the atoms in it. I could see the pulsations in it. I could see everything that's in it. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah, and well, and the joke is that you're not really seeing it. It's, it's just being seen. <laughs> that that uh, that what you are and what I am is only exists in the language. But that's not our essence, and that's and when uh, the human being at our essence, we're we're uh, what I call prisms. I think I mentioned that to you, one P R I S M, and uh, oh. we take energy and vibration and refract it into multiple patterns, and the fundamental pattern that the human form, human not the form, but the human being at our core is eternal or infinite. And then uh, the, en the energy is the, the fundamental pattern that the energy is the vibration is broken into is time space. So time we're we so time space is being created through the form, through through our core being, which is our core human being. And uh, we're doing that with, with languaging. What I call Noria, languaging. can I can I ask you uh, to either one of you or anybody about <laughs> it, it, do you find a correlation between the essence of whatever it is and the word that has been developed to name this essence? Is it just any old sound, or is there some this tree? Maybe not in English. I don't know what is their uh, original language. And did that really, because we have a biblical story about, I think it was Adam who named, Bob Dylan has a song, God gave name to all the animals, right? <laughs> Through Adam, I think. <laughs> anyway, so I, I just wonder if there is some kind of correlation between the sound vibration and the thing that we're naming. Yeah, I, well, sorry. Um, if, I'll make a comp quick comp. Yeah, the the words 
aren't just random. They're, they reflect the vibrations, interpretation of the vibration. And then that, and through the, through the languaging, we're creating the, the image, uh, the mm -hmm. form, so to speak. I, maybe Carl can add to that. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I'm speaking so clearly. Well, no. Um, so, no matter what you call the tree, the tree is still the tree, right? I mean, it's it, it's still what it is, and we still are what we are. So, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. <laughs> the, the vibration of tree, the naming is. Uh, to me, would be prior to languaging, there's no you and me, um, and there's no tree. It's the tree is when the languaging ends, all what is there is energy and vibration, and the physical form is then is is language. Humans are language through and then taking the energy and solidifying it through the language through the speaking in other words nouns pronouns do not exist except in language it comes into being in through language and then when we're born as a child like fukuoka sensei pointed out a baby does not see the tree, the word tree. And but and so until the baby as a toddler begins to speak, then the material, the the separate nouns and things come into existence. So so it's possible to in in seeing what languaging is to for and thinking is is also languaging and it's possible to 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 end the languaging and the speaking and what is seen not by you or i but what is seen which is the, the eternal seeing that is seeing is energy and energy and uh vibration and we we can see past them the mirage of solidity and all that. And, and uh, so. <laughs> I and, remember in a linguistics class I had, Norio, that there was a debate among scholars. They said, without thought, there's no, I can't remember what, no existence, which didn't make sense for the baby. Or maybe babies are thinking, I have no idea. <laughs> there's, there's a, <laughs> there is existence. Existence is. Uh, is yeah. It, is absolute. I mean, there's the eternal, and then there's the temporal, and the eternal being the infinite, and the temporal. They're actually two sides of the same coin, and and that and that, to me, is all of existence. Is that, and uh, <laughs> the listen. The joke we have. Is, uh, go ahead, Norio. Finish. The joke is that we're identifying with a, a linguistic distinction called me or norio and we don't and we and by thinking that that's really who we are we lose touch with the eternal which is which is our core nature a core being that and that the joke is we're always even though there's a losing touch of that we, it's never not there and so the joke is everything we could ever want is, is always ever present <laughs> And you know, so birth and death is part of the temporal game, and when and then what we perceive as a death is is just a temporary perception. And, and when we're playing in this form world of form, yeah. and in death we don't go anywhere because there's nowhere to go. That's the joke. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> Listen, we have two people who want to make comments. Um, I'm wondering how the rest of us are doing, we could close 
the recorded official session and then just chat among ourselves. Does that sound like a good idea? No. Yeah, yes, it sounds good to me. Okay. Well, That's... keep recording, whatever. I want okay. to we could do that. Continued. Whatever you want to so... do. Okay. <laughs> okay, in that case, uh, we'll continue. Uh, whenever our speaker needs to leave, that's we'll then just chat among ourselves. I mean, that's what we're doing now. <laughs> so um, you don't need to raise hands anymore. You can just unmute yourself and go ahead. And um, yeah. just if you could keep <laughs> your comments <laughs> rather <laughs> brief. There's there, there no more raise hands. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to. We'll just chat among ourselves. This is our yeah. open chat. I, I just want to say. Yeah. Uh, How do I go in video? Huh? I just wanted to add one thing uh, that that it's oh, possible yeah. to stop the talking to itself, the chatter, the thinking, and and uh, be the the Snorio character did that for two weeks, and uh, actually in complete silence, there was no no speak talking to itself, and. Uh, and so that's how this was all revealed to the Norio character, the temp when, his temporary character. <laughs> so I don't understand. You just said it's impossible, and then you said you no, did it, it is for possible. two weeks. It, oh, it okay. is possible, mm -hmm. and, you know, through through curiosity, inquiry. So, <laughs> and Carl, yeah. have you experienced non-thinking? Uh, right now. Sorry, sorry, couldn't resist. Uh, uh, I would say not really. I've experienced trying to not think, but I realized that I'm thinking to not think. So <laughs> I haven't I haven't reached that uh, what I would call level yet. I think I may have moments. When we're chanting, we are not thinking. When we do chanting, we're not thinking. That's you the like a place to sit. I would like to raise a question. May I? Sure. A little bit of a sh but this yeah. is the only chance I'm going to get you all to entertain it because I don't intend on writing about it. But one peaceful world. This is where you get to walk across the room. Um, there was a theory in Cushy's book that we all had to eat the same. The level of vibration, which is part <clears> of <throat> this. I don't ever see that happening. So what is your feeling about us having a peaceful world? And what do you think about this theory that we all have to eat the same? And how does the spiritual... This is Phyllis. All over the place. But what is it? What was what? the monthly uh, free? Uh, Can you hear me? Or of macrobiotic. Yeah, there, there's someone. We, we uh, can hear. We can hear background. you, Phyllis. We can hear okay. you. Uh, uh, just cross talk. There's some problems with this internet. I think. So yeah. the the questions two. One is, am I correct that that's a cushy theory? We all. <laughs> the same because we need the same vibrations in order to have a peaceful world the second level of that is the spiritual level can you have a spiritual peace without having the same diet with people and if so how can you accomplish that <clears throat> at it well they're off on another tangent yeah. well if uh, it's too clear uh, may, may i comment to, to yeah. phyllis yeah. may i make a comment uh uh, Phyllis and why can't they call on you? Uh, what uh, I the only two books I ever read of I only read two books that, that my dad wrote, and one of them was One Peaceful World. And after I read that, I was at Dunkin' Donuts with my dad, and my dad asked me what I thought of the book. And I told him, Well, I thought it was a, okay, I, I didn't quite see that it was real practical what he was talking about and all that and uh and he he said that uh he asked me well what do you then 
what is my how do how do I think that one peaceful world can be achieved? And I stopped and thought of it and, and actually didn't think of it, but I stopped and I looked at it. And I told my dad, it's actually, it's impossible to know how, what one peaceful world is or how to create one peaceful world. And uh, I told him that because the only, because peace, peace is, the way in which re we relate with each other. And that when I meet you, Phyllis or anyone, if I have a preconceived idea of what peace is, that means I'm not seeing you directly and understanding you. I have to be completely with no conceptions or ideas of who or what you are in our relating with each other for there to be peace. Anything I th think of, it, whether you have to eat this way or whatever, any ideas I have is in the way of peace. Hand up. Hand up. And so that, it and is. so one peaceful world, the goal to is not a goal, is what I'm saying. And that as the moment we make one peaceful world a goal, the only way that it can exist as a goal is when there is no peace. So making one peaceful world a goal preclude is based on the idea that there is no peace now so, <laughs> so anyway that's <laughs> what i was attempting to sh share with my dad i don't think he quite got what i was trying to share i didn't i, I couldn't articulate it very clearly Phil, uh, phyllis yeah. if if i may just uh, as an addendum to what norio is uh, is giving you here uh, about his conversation with uh, michio if you approach one peaceful world, as Norio is suggesting, not as a goal, but as the third step of uh, the four noble laws of Buddhism, it's your nirvana, and you install it there, one peaceful world, your fourth law, the fourth noble law, will be your macro practice. Thank you. Uh, David, David Sneakers, you've had your hand up the longest. Yes, hi, I'm here with David. I'm Margaret and chiming mm -hmm. in and would love to piggyback on what Norio shared. Um, so I wanted to make, I guess, five points. Um, number one, there's a wonderful colleague friend who talks about um, how everything is ultimately unknowable and uh, all we have is our limited perceptions and our limited interpretations based on our limited perceptions and our choices based on our interpretations based on our limited perceptions of what's ultimately unknowable. And I thought that was a, a very intriguing way to understand uh, um, how we operate. Um, and in regards to language, there's a wonderful book called The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. And it's about how uh, linear thinking, um, mostly from the patriarchal, patriarchal order, um, imposed itself on the more uh, intuitive sensibilities, um, the feminine principle, if you will, um, and, uh, and how that um, has severely limited us in uh, today's more patriarchal oriented societies. Um, and the other sensibility uh, worth sharing, I think, is um, David Baum, um, who talked about um, the implicate and explicate order. So the implicate order being waves of potential, um, which is akin to um, macrobiotics, where everything is infinity. Uh, everything is energy um, in infinity. Um, and through our our thoughts and intentions and choices and actions, we quote unquote collapse the wave function into an explicate order, into a reality that we experience. Um, so it's uh, and so that's how we experience the reality we experience. And I think that's a a profound sensibility. 
And in regards to uh, One Peaceful World, I'm very inspired by um, Eckhart Tolle, who um, his, the the nugget message is presence. Uh, so it's it's a way of being, and through presence, we with with uh, with our surroundings, um, with one another, um, we experience a moment to moment evolutionary impulse or uh, promptings or inspiration in spirit. Um, and he talks about how it how we're inspired into awakened doing as opposed to egoic efforting. Uh, so it's a moment by moment allowing. So so it's a wonderful way to live. So throughout the day I you know I'll sit in presence and then I'll get these prompts. Oh, this is what there is to do now. Oh, mm -hmm. this is what there is to do now. And now and I'll be in ac action again and then I'll go back into presence and um, it's and he and it's his book A New Earth and that's the nugget of I believe living one peaceful world the new a new earth so those are my nuggets my shares so far and thanks for letting me share that's amazing, <laughs> amazing. and here's David I want, to, I, want to, I want to just give a thanks to you Margaret because quite a couple several years ago or something you and your daughter sang a song on the forum called uh, May I Suggest. And it's oh, yeah. a beautiful harmony between the two of you and I've always yeah. loved it. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It was our pleasure and honor. <laughs> Why don't we what you... Tom? Or Carl, did you want to say? Uh, well, I think David was wanting to talk. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I'm just, uh, actually, I'll, uh, we'll take the, uh, the nowness. I just picked up the phone and there, there was uh, uh, the, the the forum and I just clicked on and uh, watched the Umaboshi plum and uh, I was interested in what uh, what you had to say, Carl. Uh, your story is beautiful and wonderful and uh, I think the stories make the make the macrobiotics uh, uh, elders uh, maybe popular these days. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, David. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. So yeah, Eckhart. Tola also says, you know, pay attention to the space between the words. Right. So in that space between the words, you're not thinking, but the, the witness not. consciousness. Yeah, away from consciousness. So, uh, so I. Uh, I think Phyllis already went. Sylvia has her hand up, and so does Tom. And I guess we're still doing hands. So, so why don't we go to Tom since we haven't heard yet from them? Okay. <clears throat> Unmute. Unmute yourself. There you go. Um, I remember talking to Michio, and I asked him, you know, because everybody comes to macrobiotics for different reasons, and I said, what motivated him? What was the, you know, the the point that that caused him to start, you know, seeking whatever. You know, it was one peaceful world, and then came to macrobiotics, and and he said it was the war, the war in Japan, mm. and you know it's very understandable, and so that was his 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 motivation. It seemed wasn't so much even you know like macrobiotics at first. He kind of rejected Georgia Shawa in a way and didn't want to really pursue it but then he was invited to uh to a meeting and, and you know to be polite couldn't refuse it that's you know very much a part of the culture and uh but i did ask him one time i said because you know you hear like in the bible they say there's there's always going to be wars and there's always going to be rumors of wars is that correct does it get anybody yeah, sure. that's the that's the term. Yeah, I think that's in the Bible, you know, 
And so, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, is it true that there's never going to be, you know, that that's not possible? But there's always going to be war. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, it's going to be like this. He said, there's going to be, you know, discussion and it's going to be what you say is true. But this is also true. And that's how it's going to go. And as far as the condition, the original question, I think, was nobody, the whole world is never going to be eating the same to be on the same vibration to have this ability, maybe. But macrobiotics being that there really is no set diet that everybody's going to be eating according to, you know, where they are, their condition, their climate, all of this, this variation, that there's probably going to be a lot of different, but they're going to be more in tune with nature and they're going to be healthier and so consequently more able to think clearly and be more sane, basically more mature in their thinking and their understanding. So I think that maybe that's, but he said it was going to be a thousand years before people were eating macrobiotics. So that's that's my 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 recollection about that. Hope that. Thank, so. thank you, Tom. And I, I would like to tag on to the one peaceful world thing. When that came out, um, we immediately reacted and said, "One peaceful world. Um, every front has a back. The bigger the front, the bigger the back. What's the back of one peaceful world?" So our motto on the West Coast was always many happy communities, but that's just an aside. But uh, to me, uh, there's another thing that I didn't bring up during the talk that I was gonna present, but um, so I'll do it here just because it fits in. Um, and that's basically, I got into listening to Bruce Lipton after I read The Biology of Belief. I don't know how I stumbled on that book, but I, I found it and I read it. And he was talking about the subconscious mind and how the conscious mind can process 40 bits of information per second. And the subconscious mind during that same second can process 200 million bits of information. So the subconscious mind is actually more in control than we realize. So he talks about, to, to shorten it, I'll basically give the, the bottom line, which is you're basically, your subconscious mind is basically programmed in the first seven years of life through hypnosis and repetition. So if your parents are always telling you you're no good, you're never going to amount to anything, you go to a job interview later, you have in your subconscious mind, I'm not any good, I'm not going to get this job, and you don't get the job. Meanwhile, if your parents are always telling you that you're good and you're, you know, et cetera, you have a different mindset. So basically talks about being able to change your subconscious thinking and you can change that by every night before you go to bed in the morning when you get up or you can do it anytime during the day but you have to power down the mind to what's called theta the level of theta which is where you're drowsy you're just about to go to sleep and you're like eh, and you your conscious mind is less active your subconscious mind is active and you just repeat what you want to happen, not as I would like one peaceful world, but you just say, I am peaceful, or we are peaceful. So I started doing this at one time, and just the, what I used was, I am healthy, I am happy, I am free, I am connected. And that every day when I do that, I then uh, found myself to be happier, healthier, and 
more connected and more free. So it it actually works. You get what, what you want. You just have to say what you want and verbalize it. So if you want peace, you just say, I am peace, or we are peaceful, and peace will manifest, or you'll get things will happen, synchronicity, that leads you to that conclusion. I don't know. That's just a thought I throw in there. I see we have several hands. Uh, I'll leave it to Ganat to call hands. One second. Yes, yeah, so sorry, I was uh, answering questions, written questions. Uh, Michelle, we haven't heard from Michelle, if Sylvia and Phyllis don't mind. Yeah, mine will be quick. And that's that, you know, I just heard <clears throat> the discussion now on um, what he repeats to himself daily to uh, Can himself. we see you when you're speaking? Can you hear me? Can we see you as well as hear you? Can you open your video? You can, I'm sorry, you can, you. but, <clears throat> oh, well, okay, here I am. I have, I have COVID, I'm just getting over it, so I don't look that great. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I uh, noticed into the patterns and the rhythms of words that um, they can be healing, they can wind us up and wind us down. I noticed that, um, try not to have brain fog now that I have, <laughs> COVID, but uh, I noticed that um, there's certain words that you can repeat over and over and over again, and then you can be put into a trance, and then there's songs that we can listen to over and over again, and then we get sick of that song because we can't, we're winding down by, by too much energy. So the, I think um, the uh, words can help us with spirals, I think, because we're, we're made from spirals. So I don't know if you've already gotten into it, but how would you state that what we tell ourselves can wind us up and wind us down being energetic beings and um, uh, energy patterns and um, yeah, my, my thoughts aren't great today because of COVID, <laughs> at least I can remember that. But uh, any thoughts on that? And I bet Misho covered intensely on this. I think I read somewhere that he were vibrations etc and food has vibrations and nothing nothing is at neutral even the food we eat has the elect like manic like electronic charge or something like that anyway there's probably that in words any thoughts on that trying to get me in to be clear any clarity on that thanks well i would i would say um what you think attracts what you're going to get. So if you're always thinking, I'm going to be sick, then you're more likely that you're going to get sick, in my view, if you're thinking, you know, I'm, you see what I mean? I mean, there's a, you know, the thoughts that you're putting out then influence the thoughts that you're going to get back. From the universe if if all thoughts are coming from the universe i you know I, I posited that is what i came to see or comprehend but um do we all really believe that so if we do then the thoughts that i'm getting are going to depend a lot about what i'm putting out if i'm always angry i'm more likely to get angry people reacting back to me. If I'm more peaceful, I tend to get more peaceful people reacting back to me. So the outcomes depend on what you are putting out. Carl, I had a friend of mine who wrote me a letter and said that uh, her, I don't know, relative or somebody anyway, was taken hostage by Hamas on the 7th of October and then subsequently killed. She said, this person never had, I mean, I don't, of course, know him or anything, but he was a nice person and he never da 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 and he loved and he was this and that. And she asked me if I could help her understand. And I, 
I agree with you 100% that our vibration, what we give out is what we attract. And yet, how am I going to tell her, well, you're this other person must have been angry or whatever it was to attract this extreme. I mean, we all, who knows our, what our souls choose and for what reasons. And we can say nothing is bad. It's okay to die. It's everything's okay. And yet I, I couldn't find any words to answer this friend. Like, that's what I believe. And how could I be so cruel as to say, well, he deserved it. He was the vibrational match, which I believe. Maybe it was just his time to leave, and that's the way he left. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I would have trouble in that, have, finding words for that as well. That's very... Um, things happen. Things... Ra random things happen. And... Random? What do you mean by random? Um... Uh, well, um, it would all be apparent, right? <laughs> it has to be apparent randomness because there's order in the universe. But um, so if you extend it, I mean, I would, I would never tell somebody that this happened to you because you attracted it. You know, you know what I mean? That's a tough that's thing. A thing. <laughs> you can that's that. a tough thing to say, but that's basically what we're kind of alluding to. Um, so we get into a whole nother question because when I started, there were a whole bunch of people that were into past lives, and I couldn't experience or get in touch with any of my past lives. So I figured nobody could do it, <laughs> but. I came to learn that just because I can't do something doesn't mean somebody else can. So maybe other people can do that. But if there are past lives, there could be karma from a past life that's still there if there's different ideas about, you know, past lives and whether we bring um, our ego essence with us. Well, I think that's it. I think when we are on an emotional level, then it's not the time or place to say about, well, you know, vibration, right. passion, it's, we need to have more distance. And then we can understand the beast thing and why I got it. Uh, Sylvia, you've been waiting forever. Well, on this last point, war, calamities, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, and so on, they happen all, uh, from, from the beginning of time on earth and and the the collective is 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 thread, threatened and hurt by it and whether or not the individual participates in the collective calamity or is separate from it depends on the development of the individual I had a question for Carl. I know that Julie is a certified hypnotist. So on some of the work that you did on going to center, did you work with Julia's skills? Uh, no. She's she's given me Reiki a few times. Um, oh, that's, that's good. I never asked her for hypnosis. Okay. I was curious about that. And then I had a really quick comment on the finite versus the infinite in connection with the scale of observation. Another quick comment on diet and what we know and then on peaceful world. And so on the finite versus the infinite and the scale of observation, for instance, to a body cell, then the body, you know, is the larger. But then to the to my human body, I'm a cell in the body of organic life on earth. And we know this is a unified body because every cell in existence has the same dominant positive ion, potassium. And we also know that every cell that exists has identical membrane wall around it same structure and so that 
But at any rate, this body of organic life on Earth is very small in comparison to the larger body, our solar system, of which our planet is a part or an organ or a specialized tissue. And our solar system a larger is part of a larger body, like the Milky Way and so on, till you get to the infinite that holds everything. And, th and then on the topic of clean diet, the thing is that the, the diet makes us possible. It puts us in, in touch with what we already know. That's number one. And the second thing is that the diet lets us receive information directly from source. And on the topic of peaceful world, this is a topic near and dear to my heart because the ethnic groups that existed on this planet from the beginning of time within themselves experienced one peaceful world. These groups ate a diet that was produced by the environment in which they lived. So they were on the same vibratory rate as the immediate environment. And within these groups, the, the, there, was, there was essential harmony. They understood each other. If somebody was in trouble, the group knocked themselves out to bring them back and make them a full supporting member of the tribe. It wasn't a competitive thing because they understood that their life depended on the lives of their human group, the plants, the fungi, and so on, that they were part of. These ethnic groups, their one peaceful world started to go kaput at the time of the age of exploration when some crazy people eating a diet based on extremes decided that it was time to take everybody's stuff because they had already trashed through their stuff. Sylvia, you've done a great job just now, except up until the last sentence of really encapsulating, reviewing and summarizing our whole talk today. And I really appreciate it. And I think you've given me a beautiful segue to to say thank you and good night to everyone. Carl, I'll let you have the last word. Anything to add? Oh, uh, well, just <laughs> slightly, just an idea, basically going back to Bruce Lipton, but um, Herman basically was talking, when he was talking about the trillions of cells we have in our bodies, he was relating that to us as individual persons in the universe. So yeah, one body, I, Sylvia, what you said was just right, exactly Herman to a T, exactly what he taught us. And um, Bruce Lipton, when he talks about it, he talks about getting enough membrane on the same level to which the whole, this whole earth will become one body. So that's what we're working towards. And that's maybe what Misha talked about thousands of years away. But that's what we're basically in his mind working towards. I just throw it out as a, as a ending thought. It's a beautiful vision. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for participation. We see that this was uh, well attended. We had over 50 people at one point and certainly a lot of interest. We've gone an extra hour, just about. Carl said, no, no, just one hour. And here we've easily taken up two and could probably continue. So thank you very much to everybody. And I'll be Great. sending out the recording. Thank you. A week or so. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.